This program was made possible by generous grants from the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, the Jewish Federation of Greater Kansas City, and the Jewish Heritage Foundation of Greater Kansas City, with special consideration from Outpost Worldwide. In the summer of 1941, two years after World War II began, Germany controlled a sizable territory that extended from Norway through Greece and from France into the Western Soviet Union. Sometime that summer, after the June invasion of the Soviet Union, Adolf Hitler decided to murder all of Europe's Jews. More than nine million men, women, and children. He called this genocide the final solution to the Jewish problem in Europe. Hitler charged Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler with the task of overseeing the destruction process. Himmler was head of the SS, a vast bureaucracy that controlled Germany's law enforcement agencies and the concentration camp system. In addition, in 1939, the SS assumed responsibility for implementing Hitler's anti-Jewish policies. Over the next few months, certain crucial decisions were made. Among them were the following. Six death camps would be established to facilitate the genocide. Four of these camps, Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Majdanek, would be located in German-occupied Poland, the so-called general government. Two camps, Helmno and Auschwitz, would be located in the parts of Poland annexed directly into Germany. The Jews would be transported to the death camps by railroad. They would be asphyxiated with some form of poison gas, either carbon monoxide or hydrogen cyanide, also known as Zyklon B, in stationary chambers or in specially fitted gassing trucks. Auschwitz was the largest and most technologically sophisticated of the six death camps. It was located 37 miles west of the Polish city of Krakow, on the outskirts of the town of Auschwitz, near the pre-war German-Polish border, in a region known as Eastern Upper Silesia. Auschwitz was really a large complex of three different camps. Auschwitz I, the main camp, opened in May 1940, was a concentration camp for Polish political prisoners and Soviet prisoners of war. Auschwitz II, also called Birkenau or Auschwitz-Birkenau, was the death camp. Construction on it began in October 1941. It had four Zyklon B gas chamber crematorium combinations. Each structure had three components, a disrobing area, a large gas chamber, and banks of crematorium ovens. Auschwitz-Birkenau also had barracks to house thousands of prisoners, as well as warehouses where the belongings of those deported to the camp were sorted and stored before being sent to Germany. Auschwitz III, also called Buna Monowitz, was established in May 1942. It was a slave labor camp that served various large industrial corporations, such as IG Farben, Siemens, and Krupp Steel. In addition, numerous subcamps, mostly slave labor facilities, also covered an area for many miles around. Between 1942 and 1944, trains arrived at Auschwitz-Birkenau almost daily, carrying transports of Jews from all over German-occupied Europe. To save money, the SS used freight cars, filling them with as many people as possible. When they took us to the train station, and I saw they put us in those cattle trains, I said, it is a disaster. The freight train pulled up. We were herded into these, uh, into the freight cars. The doors were sealed. I would say there were about 80 people or 70 people in each one of these cars. Conditions in the trains were brutal. 
The cars were so overcrowded that, in many cases, less than two square feet of space was allotted per individual. They were also filthy and without adequate ventilation. People endured intense heat during the summer and freezing cold during the winter. No food or water was provided, even when the journey took many days. Aside from a bucket, no sanitary facilities existed, and the stench of urine and excrement added to the victim's humiliation and suffering. Armed guards accompanied the transports with orders to shoot anyone trying to escape. Many died before the trains reached their destinations. We went in in the train, and we didn't have any seats. We were sitting on the floor, and there were little children and old people. For three days and three nights, the train went like that, back and forth, and back and forth. And people, little children were crying and screaming. They didn't give you nothing to eat. They didn't give you nothing to drink. People were defecating. People were vomiting. People were dying. We stayed almost for a week in the trains. The trains was like they put the animals. Not even the animals. They are like this, with a small little window with the bars. And over there, you starve to death. You, sh you put a, a blanket in one corner and you do go to bathroom over there, and a lot of people die inside the wagons. The smell, the starvation, the hard time. So, and when they, we say for water, they put the hose, they stop the train and they put the hose, and the water, they, they spray everybody up in the mouth like this for to get water in the mouth. Just what the horse he was sprayed to us. We didn't get anything to eat, and we didn't get anything to drink for many, many days. They, they had German guards sitting on, on top of each one of these cars with uh, submachine guns. And uh, after a day or two, the conditions in that railroad car were absolutely unspeakable. We tried to cut some holes into the floor of the railroad car, and we were able to, and somebody had some tools, and we were trying to let ourselves through these holes between the rails and uh, maybe lay there until the train pulled away and possibly escaped. But that didn't go very far because somebody had tried that from a, a car behind us, and the Germans had gotten wise to it, and they were just shooting the people right there while they were trying to lay there. So we decided not to get out. I remember that the weather got very cold and a lot of elderly people froze to death in these cars. And I think we were on the way for at least four days. That's not that big a distance, but the train would stop and it would go and it would stop and it would go. I cannot remember that they ever opened any, any of these cars to even give people water. By the time the train stopped in Birkenau, which of course is Auschwitz. They opened the door, it was early in the morning. I think two thirds of the people in this car were dead. It just thought this was it. There was little just slits on the deck that train on the cars, crowded, no sanitary equipment. I mean, this is this was it. You had to do everything in this car. You couldn't breathe. You were choking. It was no food. It just, it was so inhuman. It was so horrible. I thought this, this is it. I mean, we will never make it. And my mother, I never forget, she was trying so hard to keep saying it will be okay not to worry. My father, 
father praying, always praying. No one was listening. German policy dictated that all Jews brought to Auschwitz-Birkenau were to be murdered. The vast majority were murdered in one of the four gas chambers immediately on arrival. But a few were murdered in a more drawn-out manner, either as a result of medical experiments or hard labor. The process of deciding who would be murdered immediately and who would be murdered eventually was called selection. The selection process began as soon as the trains arrived at the death camp. Originally, the trains stopped at a siding a half mile away and the deportees were forced to walk the remaining distance. But in spring of 1944, a railroad spur was built to carry the trains directly into the camp. This allowed selections to take place very soon after the trains pulled in, right alongside the tracks, an area known as the ramp. Arrival at Auschwitz-Birkenau was chaotic and confusing. Finally, after three days, the train stopped and it was like five in the morning. We didn't really know where we were and some people looked out and saw people lined up in striped uniform and lots of noise. It was a big platform and they opened doors and lights all over, glaring, cold morning. It was, I think, in May. And uh, lots of soldiers, as soldiers with, with their guns and bayonets, and all the workers. We saw a sign that said Auschwitz, and you didn't know what was happening. It was just German shepherds, dogs all over. When they finally opened the door to the railroad car, we were sitting on the railroad siding in Birkenau, about 30 feet from us, there was this electrical barbed wire, and we saw the first prisoners in striped uniforms behind it. No matter how old or infirm people were, or how weak and dazed from the terrible trip, they were rushed off the trains. Once off the train, they were rushed along the arrival ramp and made to leave behind all of their meager belongings. When we arrived to Auschwitz, there was that assessment with the big gun. And he starts saying, Raus, 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 raus. That means, get out, get out, get out. Get out. And if you didn't walk this real fast, he took that gun and, and hit you. And if you didn't move faster, he took the gun and just shot you right in front of everybody's eyes. Lined up, screaming, come fast, fast, rouse, rouse, and drop everything. Everything will be sent to you. Just leave it where it is. We didn't have much time to contemplate that. The weather was terrible. It was raining. The, the German guards, the first time we saw SS, in accident, and they beat us out of these cars, and we were lined up. Families and friends were split apart as the Germans forced them to divide into three groups. Women and children, men and boys, and those who were too weak or too ill to walk. These last were often the disabled and the elderly. Those who could not walk waited at the side of the ramp next to the trains for trucks to come and pick them up. Everyone else was lined up on the ramp, five abreast. Men and boys in one line, women and children in another. They <coughs> divided the separation, the women and the men, and the young and the old. And if you care a child, you go with old people. 
And so I went with my two sisters. My other sister, she was carrying the little boy, five year old. So she went with my mother. My brother Joseph, he was 11 years old. He went with my mother. My father separated, and my two brothers went separate. One of my brother was 15, and the other one was 16 and a half. Henri, Aaron, and Menachem, and Yosef went with my father, with my mother. And my sister, Matilda, and my sister, Julia, the one I survived with her, and I, we went three together. Line up five in a row and separate the men and the women. And they, they want my brother and father and brother went to my cousin to one side and we went this side. And we still didn't know what was going on. And the selection began. As the lines moved along, SS officers, often medical personnel, decided who was to be murdered immediately and who was to be processed into the camp for slave labor and other purposes. Usually, more than three-fourths of each transport was selected for immediate murder. This included all children, all women with children, all the elderly, and everyone else who, after a hasty inspection, the SS considered unfit for work. The number of people the SS selected to be processed into the camp usually depended on the number of people needed in the camp on any given day. If more people were needed, more people would be sent into the camp. If fewer people were needed, fewer people would be sent into the camp. But even so, the number of people sent into the camp was always a very small proportion of the actual number of fit and healthy people who arrived on the transports. Of course, the new arrivals were not told this. All they were told was to go to the right or to the left. And sometimes not even that. We got off from the train, so there were a bunch of assessments staying and laughing and giggling with the dogs. And they would one go this way, one go this way. They said to the right and to the left, and to the right and to the left. Nobody knew what's right, and nobody knew what's left. And that was the assessment stay with the fresh light. Left, right, gesund, krank, gesund, healthy, sick, healthy, sick. Sick on one side, healthy. Some guys complain, they say they get sick. They go to a hospital or something. I didn't know when they say sick, they go straight to the chimney. My cousin who was visiting Shari, who couldn't go back, she was tall and she was on the end in the front holding my hand and my little brother was holding my hand. My brother, my mother and my sister suddenly just knew we were caught like this. We were thrown one side, we were thrown another side. Last time I saw my mom and my sister and my brother. Those selected for immediate murder were directed to one of the four crematoria at the north end of the camp. Although again, they were unaware that this was where they were going. When the transport start coming into Auschwitz, days many very often <clears throat> when I was walking in our columns to go already to back to our, you know, camp and seeing those people when they were running them to the guest chamber, and on the way those people asking to us, you know, just bewildered, where are where they taking us? And we were cordoned always with SS, you know, and, and, the, uh, uh, and the German shepherds. You are afraid to say anything. And uh, the horrible feeling I still even see them walking and asking again, again, what, where are we going? Crematorium 2 and 3 were mirror images of each other. Located close to the women's barracks, 
they were the largest murder facilities in the entire death camp system. Their vast disrobing rooms and gas chambers were located underground, and a hydraulic lift carried the victims' bodies up to the oven rooms. We saw, when we went to the barracks, when we laid down, we saw the fire very, very high, sky high. They burned all the people. Crematorium 4 and 5 were located in a grove of birch trees, where victims would often wait to be taken to the gas chambers. Those selected for medical experimentation were turned over to SS physicians, like Dr. Joseph Mengele and Dr. Carl Klauberg whose operating rooms and laboratories were located elsewhere in the camp complex. They conducted race science research on infants, twins, and people with physical abnormalities and performed forced sterilizations and other experiments on adults. People chosen for these experiments rarely survived. Those designated fit for work went through a registration process. They were deloused and their head and body hair was shaved. They stripped us from all the clothes, from everything. They shaved us everywhere. They marched us into an area, and uh, we had to undress and just keep our shoes on, and chairs were lined up. It was like a big, tiled area, and... Uh, all the Gestapo's and, and, and SS all running around, everybody suddenly pushed into a chair and they shaved your hair completely. And you were like in a daze. You just really didn't know what was going on. You were moved along like in an assembly line and they just pushed you completely. I just kept holding my cousin, trying to get, be together and not to be separated. And uh, we were then taken into a huge shower area. And we re really didn't know that much about the crematorium at that time. We didn't know what was going on, what will be, what water came out and, and they said, scrub yourself and, and DDT and all that. They were also tattooed with their prisoner identification numbers, a practice unique to Auschwitz. They put a number on your arm and the, you was not a name there, only the number. We had to line up and there was a prisoner. I remember the little prisoner about some friends, about the Jewish prisoner. He, his only job he had to do was to tattoo the prisoners. That was painful. That prisoner, that was the only job he had to do, tattoo thousands of prisoners. And that was like a pen with a needle and ink. It was very painful. They put us in a big room, and there were two SS women with the dead, with the dead heads, you know, on, on the head, what they had. And they were holding our hand like this. One held their hand like this, and one went with a needle and put on a number. And I said, why are you putting a number on my hand? I didn't do nothing wrong. And she took her hand and she slapped me on both sides of my face. And she said, if you don't shut up, I'm going to put it all over your head. They were then issued uniforms or camp clothing, pants, shirts, and caps for the men, dresses and kerchiefs for the women, but no coats or outerwear, and generally no socks or underwear. Their shoes were often crude wooden clogs. They gave us uniforms from the Russian soldiers, lice infested. And we put on a pair of pants and a jacket from the Russian soldiers. They gave me, which I never forget, 
a brown dress with one sleeve and I, no hair, no nothing, wooden shoes. It was just horrible. We looked one at each other and we didn't recognize each other. Threw us some clothes and uh, some kind of shoes. And uh, we, we put it on and uh, it, it, it just looked at each other. We, we just couldn't even recognize each other who was friends or cousins standing next to me. After that, they were assigned to a barracks in Auschwitz-Birkenau and to work details. We got an order where we would go on the block, the barracks, terrible, overcrowded, sanitary condition, you know, those guys which were in charge, block also, but they called student in the guy we had to clean the, the room. They were very hard on us. If one of the prisoners, we, we were prisoners now, we, well, in fact, they beat you. That was unusual, not unusual to beat you up, you know. And then we were assigned to the carts, you know, like a bunk, all wooden plank with some straw on it, three, uh, three layers. I was on top, you see. Because I was young, I could go up there. We had a terrible condition, sanitary condition. We had no soap or nothing. The way I brushed my teeth, I took my finger, water, and brushed my teeth this way. And we slept in a, um, like a wooden things, one, two, and three on one, and three on the top. And um, no covers, no nothing. And we slept on, on bridges, on beds, on bunker beds. And we slept like herrings, you know. We were on a side, you had to lay on a side. Four or six people, depends how wide the bunker was. Four or six, if it was a little wider, six people. And we couldn't move, we just had to lay like this. We were lined up and taken out into a barrack area, sea lager, and put, put, put into a huge barrack. Lots of people were there and was taken to a bar, um, bed area, it's all, it was wooden beds, and it was just wood and one single bed blanket, and <coughs> we were shown that was it, and ten of us in this small little area, and this went on a very long room, and there was a young woman who was charge of the barrack, a couple, and she was always screaming. The inmates spent long hours at back-breaking labor, inadequately clothed, in all kinds of weather, with little or no food. In the morning, we had to assemble and stay in line. They conned us every morning, but the officers were not so in a hurry to count us. So let us stay for an hour and a half, two hours in the cold weather, open prairie. Everybody was trying to hide behind each other. The wind was really killing us. Cold, windy place. And I don't know, it was probably zero outside. Cold. And, uh, and that was going on. You know, I don't remember how long I was in Auschwitz. I, forgot. I didn't know what day it is, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I didn't know day or night. I just knew it's dark and I knew it's light. That's the only thing I knew. I didn't know what day it was on me. No paper. You couldn't keep, some of them made notches, you know, because nobody told us what day it is. And five o'clock in the morning, we would get up for it. We used to call it a tailor bell. That means uh, like a roll call. 
and the assessment would come and he would count us. And we would stay barefooted on the cement. And then we had to walk, go to work. I worked, we built forests. One girl would cut out a piece of soil. We, we, we worked three in a group. And one girl would hold a tree in her hand after I cut the, cut the piece of soil, she would put in and take out, scoop out the dirt, and then I would put in the tree inside and march around it and, and stumble, you know, one girl would stumble around the dirt so the tree would grow. Well, we had a work detail outside, and we marched out of Birken High every day to build a road which led to no place. We also, when we got back into the camp, we had to perform punishment labor. We had to take blocks of cement and jog around the camp on a prescribed route with this thing on the back, on our backs, and then we, after we performed that for about an hour, then we could come inside and get whatever lousy food they, they had. Every morning we left Auschwitz camp and uh, marched to that place where we were working. Our work was senseless. Like, uh, let's say, the river was going, Visula River was going uh, straight. They wanted it to curb it, you know, and we stood there in the mud, in the water, and dig, and dig, and dig. They took us to work uh, as a house commando. House commando is outside, in the rain, in the snow, you know, just to break, like, you know, those telephone poles, the big ones, they used to have handles, and we used to push them to break the walls. So the walls, was a brick, and then we take the bricks and we clean the cement out. The first job I had was a cable commando. Like here, when the power, com power company puts cable down, done by machine. That was done by us. We had to walk so many prisoners in a row and at a certain pace. And next to us was always the guards with, with the guns. And like I mentioned before, if he didn't like that guy, he took the cap. He had to have a cap on, you know, prisoner cap. I took the cap and threw it away. The prisoner had to get retrieved the cap. He stepped out and he shot him and killed him. Then we had uh, picks and shovels. We had to dig out big deals, you know, and then lay the cables. But the worst thing was, those cables were heavy. And let's say every 10 feet was another prisoner. If one prisoner fell, you had a double load. I, I was going to work to, a, I don't know how do you say, fields, but we uh, only uh, knocked on um, big stones, make small gravel. This was our job. And then they would give us to eat nothing, only till the evening. When we come, they give us a little slap water with something in it and a piece of bread. We were called outside to line up for the appeal every morning, two hours, till they counted thousands and thousands of people. It was very cold, and if you moved, they pulled you out and they shot you right there, or for no reason. They just went through, walked the German, the SS soldiers with sticks and constantly feeding or pulling out or doing something. And if someone was missing, you had to stand for hours and hours. Either it was extremely cold or very hot. In the evening again, it was the same thing, twice a day. We were constantly hungry. I mean, Lost 30 pounds within 
four weeks, absolutely zero food. I mean, food, we were, garbage would look good if we could find it. We always volunteered for work detail to get out, to, to try to work close to the garbage dump, to see if we could get some potato peels or whatever to try to, to survive. It was constant pain, hunger pain. In one time, what I remember, they have the German Shepherds, you know, the big dogs. Mm -hmm. They give the, the dog eat, a soup, a, a big thing to eat. He left, and I finished this. So, oh, this helped me so much. I said, this dog's food, so hungry. I finished the soup from the dog left. They were also subjected to periodic selections, where those the SS deemed no longer fit for work were sent to the gas chambers. Given all of this, the Germans did not expect them to live more than two or three months. There were selections, and we had to parade nude with one arm up to see if the ribs are showing. If the ribs were showing, you were too skinny to uh, work or, or to have any uh, strength to do anything. We used to bite our lips so our lips would look red. We would bite them and we would pinch the cheeks so they would be looking red so we wouldn't look sick to them. If we look sick, they take you right away to the crematorium. My sister Matilda, she was very depressed and she was not reading enough. She was skin and bone. So one time they made a big selection, they took her, she escaped. The second time, she can escape. There was a big selection. Selection means, you know, it's, uh, if they see you a little uh, bruise, if they see you a little uh, scratch on your body, you're not good enough for work. You are good enough to go to crematorium. And if you, the bones, they see you, the bones come out from your skin, you are entitled to go to crematorium. So that's what happened to my sister. Even before a selection was completed, the belongings left behind by the victims were loaded onto trucks by groups of prisoners. They were taken to an area near Crematorium 4 where other prisoners sorted and organized them. They said they want a shoe commando. The shoes from the transport that was bringing so many people, we have to take the shoes and clean the leather separate and the salt separate to tear them up, everything, you know, and they send them to the factories in Germany. Then they were stored in wooden horse barns for eventual transport to Germany. Camp inmates nicknamed this area Canada because they considered Canada a rich country and the warehouses contained an abundance of goods. Within a few hours, the selection and processing of the victims and their belongings were completed and the ramp was being cleaned up in preparation for the arrival of the next transport. On October 7, 1944, several hundred prisoners who worked in Crematorium 4 and were known as the Zonderkommando revolted after learning that they were going to be killed. Using explosives smuggled into the camp by Jewish women working as slave laborers in a nearby armaments factory, they blew up the crematorium and killed three guards. But the Germans put down the revolt and killed most of the prisoners involved, including the three women who were publicly hanged. The following month, in November 1944, Heinrich Himmler ordered the SS to stop the gassings and disable all still-functioning crematoria. And in January 1945, as the Soviet army approached the camp, the SS destroyed the remaining crematoria. At the same time, the SS began evacuating Auschwitz and its subcamps. 
They forced nearly 60,000 weak, starving, and inadequately dressed prisoners to march west in the snow and cold for nearly 30 miles, shooting anyone who fell behind or could not continue. Thousands died before being put on unheated freight trains bound for concentration camps in Germany and Austria. The rail journey lasted for days. Without food, water, shelter, or blankets, many prisoners did not survive the trip. We had to walk, I know, for many hours to the, to the railroad station. And there was open freight cars in winter car. Tremendous cold. So crowded, you couldn't believe it. I don't know exactly at this time how many thousand prisoners we were. Let me just give a rough estimate, three and a half thousand, four thousand. In five days, 75% of the prisoners died. What we did, when the prisoners next to you died, fell over, he took his clothes off, put the clothes on for us, and threw the prisoner overboard. This was very well documented after the war. The only water we had was the snow. Do you know what it means, sanitary condition? You couldn't believe it. Because we had no control over nothing, you know? And then uh, we, it took us five days from Auschwitz to come to Buchmalp. They took all of us who was able to walk, still in, in pretty good shape. We got one blanket and a ration of one can, I think this was some kind of meat, you know, horse meat, I think, yeah, horse meat, and a uh, in a um, portion of bread. I cannot tell you exactly if it was a half a bread or a whole bread. And, um, and uh, you know, we had wooden shoes, naturally. And they took us, we walked for days and days. And already in, in the snow. After this, they put us uh, also in open cars, you know, cattle cars. And this was in the winter, mind you. And all we had is just one little blanket. And the snow was already falling. And we were driving in those, uh, you know, uh, with those trains. I don't, don't ask me how many days we probably went through all Germany. We went on until we came to, um, finally, to um, uh, Dachau. In front of the Dachau, we were, um, segregated like half of the women went to uh, Bergen-Belsen and half of the women, whatever, went to Gross Rosen. I fell into Bergen-Belsen. On January 27, 1945, when the Soviet army entered the Auschwitz complex, the soldiers found only about 7,000 inmates, many of whom were ill or dying. Between 1940 and 1945, about 1.1 million people were murdered at Auschwitz. Nearly 90% of them, including some 200,000 children, were Jews. <laughs> 